ZTE has a new phone. It's the Axon 10 Pro that we saw first announced at MWC 2019 back in February. But there's a couple things you should know about this phone before we really dive into it. First of all, there are two variants. This is the ZTE Axon 10 Pro the 4G version, and then there's also the ZTE Axon 10 Pro, the 5G version. Now they're both almost exactly the same. The only difference is the 5G one has a 5G capable modem, which means you'll be able to connect to 5G networks in you know, supported areas. Uh, and it has liquid cooling so that it helps keep the phone uh, cool when it's doing a lot of you know switching and finding networks and all that jazz. So that helps the phone stay cooler, which is important for the 5G one, but that is not available on the 4G phone. Now, one more thing, we don't really know yet if this phone is coming to the US. ZTE has announced it and launched it in Germany already, but it's also gonna be launching other parts of the world. They haven't really confirmed yet whether it's coming to the US, but hopefully maybe at some point it will. Now, onto the phone. So the first two things that pop out when I look at this phone, the Axon 10 Pro, is the rear design and the front display. Uh, the rear design, I think, is one of ZTE's best-looking phones to date. They have an elegant little screen that's kind of minimal, has beautiful blue sheen to it. It's glass, so it does pick up a lot of fingerprints and dust, but what phone doesn't these days? Uh, I do think they kind of mimic Huawei here with the P20 Pro design. It has a dual camera set up set in a separate module, and that third camera is just sitting just outside it, along with the little camera details and the ZTE logo. Very Huawei P20-esque but you know, it still looks good, and I think that's fine with me. Uh, over the edges, you're getting a tapered edge, so it's sort of curved inwards, so the edges feel a little thin, but I still think it feels very comfortable and pretty easy to hold despite it having a 6.47 inch screen. Now speaking of the screen, you're getting a pretty edge-to-edge -edge experience. The bezels have been shaved down quite a bit, and you do get a notch here at the top, but well, a lot of phones have that these days, unless it's a hole punch camera like on the Galaxy S10. Uh, nevertheless, I think the screen looks really good. Uh, it does seem to get pretty bright, but we really haven't done much testing other than using it in this little dimly lit room. Uh, and otherwise, I think it's also pretty sharp looking. It's a full HD uh, resolution, so that's 2340 by 1080 pixel resolution, and it is an AMOLED screen, so you're getting more vibrant colors and deeper blacks but we'll definitely have to spend more time with the screen to see how it really is uh, in just everyday situations. There's only two buttons on the phone with the volume rocker on the right edge and the power button right below it. The power button has this little red dot to sort of indicate that it is a power button, which is kind of neat, I guess. And over on the bottom is the USB Type-C charging port. And you'll also notice the bottom firing speaker is over here, but it is a stereo speaker, so you're getting the benefit of the top speaker as well for some true surround sound and that's pretty good because that's something that the Axon brand has been known for, always trying to deliver a good sound experience. And I'm sure this will hold up as well. We'll definitely have to do a little more sound testing to be sure. The one thing I wanna spend a little bit more time on is the camera because it's what seems to really stand out on this phone. You're getting a 48 megapixel sensor right here in the middle and it's just a standard lens. Over on the top is an eight megapixel telephoto lens and over outside in the outside of the module is a 20 megapixel wide angle lens. Now that's not the first time ZT has done a wide angle lens but they did bump the megapixel count from the previous Axon 9. So you're getting slightly sharper photos ideally. Uh, now, the 48 megapixel sensor isn't actually giving you super high res files when you take a photo. Now, you can, you have to dive into the settings, choose the 48 megapixel option, and then you can get these super high res files. I don't know if the image quality will be just as good. I did try to take a couple shots right now and they kind of look fine, but really the 48 megapixel shot is probably more ideal to use when you have really well lit conditions. And that seems to be the case with any phone that uses a 48 megapixel sensor. By default, you're going to get 12 megapixel output. So essentially what it's doing is called pixel binning, where it's combining four pixels to get more light. And by getting in more light, you're getting better low light shots. So by default, that's what you're going to get. And so by default, your low light photos will hopefully be better. Again, I took a couple shots in this you know, briefing room that I'm in, so it's really hard to tell what's good and what's bad. And over on the top is an eight megapixel telephoto lens, and basically that's a standard three times optical zoom, so that's pretty nice because typically most phones only have a two times optical zoom. Uh, and it can do a five times hybrid zoom where it sort of combines all those uh, data to get you a even better than digital zoom, five times zoom. 
Uh, and of course, you can also do a 10 times digital zoom, though the quality is probably eh at that point. ZT has also made the camera a little smarter. There's a couple of AI tweaking going on. Uh, for example, it can recognize some scenes like a lot of other phones can, and it'll then enhance the photo uh, to make that scene look a little better. So if it'll recognize food, for example, and tweak the photo to look maybe a little more saturated or something like that. Uh, there's also things like uh, it'll detect when there's not enough light, so it'll automatically switch to the low light mode in the phone to uh, you know combine those images and get you a night shot that'll give you better lighting, better or better looking photo at the end of the day. And of course, if it detects that maybe it, a photo might be better looking if you swap to the wide angle camera, it'll auto automatically do that for you. And uh, that's pretty smart. And it's something we're seeing a lot more in, in most smart cameras these days. And in terms of the software, it's not an Android One phone, but ZTE is using stock Android and they've simplified the approach. So you're getting really something very similar to Android One. It's just a very clean Android UI. Uh, ZTE has basically got rid of a lot of its old flourishes, so you're not bogged down with a lot of bloatware or anything like that. Um, and it just overall feels very smooth and fast, and uh, that's likely because this is powered by the Qualcomm Snapdragon 855 processor, which is basically the flagship processor of choice for Android phones this year. Things like the Galaxy S10 have it, so it's definitely a powerful phone. And on top of that, you're also getting six gigs of RAM for the base version, but there also is an eight gig of RAM version as well. And correspondingly, you also get 128 gigs of storage or 256 gigs of storage based on what RAM option you choose from. In Asia, I believe in China, there is a 12 gig RAM option. So that exists. It's just you probably won't see that wherever you are uh, in a Western country or something like that. Um, otherwise, the software is, is pretty clean. They did say that they made even further enhancements to take it even further um, in terms of providing a very clean and stock UI. Google Photos is now the default gallery app. There's no ZTE gallery app, for example. So that's a nice little way to just, you know, simplify the OS a little more and get rid of redundant apps when they aren't necessary. And the smart features aren't just happening in the camera, but also in the software as well. ZT is basically using machine learning algorithms to figure out what apps people are using the most, preload them, and that should theoretically drop uh, app launch times by up to 30%. And even it, help, it should help long-term usage basically by the 20 month uh, time frame when phones usually start to lag, this phone maybe might not. Again, that's something we'll have to long-term test to really see if how, how well that holds up. There's a in-display fingerprint sensor as well. We haven't been able to try it out and it doesn't also show up once it's not set up yet. So it's something we'll have to set up when we have a little more time with the device and see how it holds up to phones like the OnePlus 7 Pro, which just came out with a improved fingerprint sensor. So it'd be nice to see if this is a so, sort of a, a pain point of the phone as we have seen with some phones with in-display fingerprint sensors or if it actually is an improved experience that it's something we'll use every day. But of course, if it doesn't work out, there's also face unlock, so you can always use that for uh, quickly unlocking the phone, though it's not secure like Apple's Face ID. And like a lot of other phones that we've seen from OnePlus or Honor with a gaming setting specifically to enhance the gaming experience, this phone also comes with a Game Assist app. You can add your games to it, and basically there's a lot of things you can do in terms of customizing the experience, such as doing things like Game Booster to make sure the CPU is giving it all it can for uh, having the game perform really well, uh, to Network Optimizer, which sort of disables background files in the process so you're not hampering your game if you're playing an online game especially. Uh, and there's things like you can do, make sure it's 60 FPS so that you can get a smooth gaming experience. And uh, just overall, it's just, you know, focusing on making sure your gaming experience is really strong. And uh, one of my favorites is the ability to sort of disable notifications as soon as you launch a game. Always a nice thing because you don't want pop-up notifications showing up when you're, you know, driving a car. And considering it's this thin, I'm really surprised they managed to squeeze a 4,000 milliamp hour battery in here. But of course, that should theoretically last about a full day, if not more but we've seen phones like the One Pro 7 Pro where the screen is so demanding that we've actually gotten mediocre battery life really. So that could also be the case here. Uh, well, that will definitely require longer term testing to find out. Uh, however, there is fast charging through the USB-C port or wireless charging as well if you wanna just place this on a wireless charger. So how much does this cost? Well, we know the European pricing, it's 599 for the six gig RAM version, which comes with 128 gig storage. There's also an eight gig RAM version with 256 gig storage. Uh, but basically you can only buy this phone in Germany and some other parts of the world, Europe basically, uh, not the US. There's a separate Chinese version as well for the Chinese market. Uh, but 
again, we'll have to wait and see if this phone comes out in the US. And I think if it does, it could give OnePlus uh, a, a, a sure run for its money, especially compared to the heftier price tag of the new OnePlus 7 Pro. Hey, if you enjoyed that video, please hit the like button and subscribe to Digital Trends for more content of the coolest tech products.